Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this beautiful day you've given us and for the opportunity we have to assemble this morning. We're thankful for each one present. We pray for those who are not able to be with us, especially those we mention as being sick and in nursing homes. We pray for the, the families that lost of loved ones this past week. We pray that you will comfort them. Father, we pray for this congregation and for the work that it's involved in. We pray that much good will come from it. We pray, Father, that we will have a, a strong desire to reach out around us to those who are lost and try to teach them the gospel that they might become Christians and be saved. Father, be with us as we enter into this period of Bible study. Help us to open our Bibles, to follow along, and to be receptive of the things that are said. We're thankful for all of the teachers in the back who are teaching this morning for their desire and their willingness to teach. Be with us as we continue the day and be with us through our worship hour. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. This morning we're going to begin a study of the book of First Peter. If you'd like to be turning there, uh, we will pick up with chapter 1 in, in a few minutes. Uh, I thought it's some things that would be interesting to know before we begin in First Peter chapter 1 this morning. I thought we'd look at the authorship, who this person Peter is, the time and the place and the occasion of the writing of First Peter. We begin with a point that is agreed upon by most people, and that being the first epistle of Peter, it was written by the apostle of that name. In fact, there's no ancient writing whatsoever of which there's more certainty in, regarding, in regard to the authorship. There's a lot of evidence that w which we'll list to back up this statement. But first, let's look at who this man Peter was. We know from Matthew 16 and verse 17 that Simon Peter was the son of Jonah. Uh, verse 17 mentioned Bar Jonah, mean, and this means the son of Jonah. The word Bar is Aramaic for son. We know that his brother was named Andrew in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 2. And they and their father owned a commercial fi fishing business, doing their fishing from the Sea of Galilee. Peter's home was in Bethsaida, a fishing village on the coast of the Sea of Galilee, in John chapter 1, verse 44. Uh, the exact location of this first century city is in doubt, but most scholars agree that it was located not far from Capernaum, uh, perhaps a part of that city or a suburb of, of that city. And Bethsaida, the name itself, means house of fishing or fishery. Peter lived there with his wife, and at some times his mother-in-law lived there with him. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 14 mentions that Jesus came to Peter's house, and his wife, mother, lay there sick of a fever. There's no direct uh, mention of Peter and his wife having children, but we know that they did because uh, Peter refers him to himself as a fellow elder in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. And we know that the qualifications of elders requires them to have ch uh, children, 1 Timothy 3, verse 3 and 4, and Titus 1, verse 6. His wife is also said to go with him when he left his home to go preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5 tells us. We first meet Peter with his brother Andrew when Andrew, having discovered that Jesus to be the Messiah, takes Simon to Jesus in John chapter 1, beginning with verse 35. At this time, Simon is given the name Cephas, which has the English meaning of rock, a rock or a stone. And later, Peter and Andrew were fishing, and Jesus called out to them to come for them to come go with him. In Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, 
indicates that Zebedee and his sons, James and John, were partners in that fishing business. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 22 uh, shows us that the two father and son teams were working separately. So they were in the business together, but evidently they owned two boats and therefore were, uh, were, would be fishing in two different locations. When Jesus calls these four men, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, to come and go with him, it's said that they left their nets and their boats with Zebedee's keeping with the servants in indicating that it was a larger business than just these two families could handle in Mark chapter 1, verse 17 through 20. Like almost all of the other early followers of Christ, Peter was a disciple of John the Baptist. Of course, we know that Peter was one of the original 12 apostles. In fact, uh, in the listing of the apostles in the New Testament, Peter was always listed as first uh, in that prominent first position. And we see this in Matthew 10, verse 2, Mark 3, verse 13 through 19, Luke 6, verse 12 through 16, and Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. Peter would serve as a very important part of, the, of Christ's life and work. With James and John, he would be present with Jesus when the damsel was raised from the dead in Mark chapter 5 and verse 22 and through 20, 43. He would be present at the transfiguration when Moses and Elijah appeared in Matthew 17, beginning in verse 1. And he would be an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, verse 37. Peter always seemed to be an impulsive kind of man. Because it was Peter who first answered the great question from Christ at Caesarea Philippi. It was Peter who jumped from the boat onto the sea to walk to Christ. It was Peter who so powerfully spoke, he of all men would never deny him. And it was Peter who drew his sword to defend Christ. And then it was also Peter, of course, who denied him three times in the palace of the high priest and then went out and wept so bitterly over his failure. After Peter's fall at this trial, Peter, uh, Jesus sent word specifically to him for, of his resurrection in Mark 16 and verse 7. And he and John were the first of the apostles at the empty tomb. In a private conversation with Peter, uh, Jesus three times asked him to express his love for him. And three times he instructed Peter to feed my sheep in John 21, verse 15 through 17. And Peter, being fully restored and forgiven, would, would have a major role in the work of founding the church and preaching the gospel under the Great Commission. It was Peter who preached the first sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 16 and following. Peter was given the keys to the kingdom, which he opened wide first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles in Matthew 16 and verse 19. More than one time, Peter was captured, he was threatened, and he was imprisoned. And when his fellow worker, James, the brother of John, was put to death, Peter would have had that same fate at the hands of Herod had, had there not been a divine inter deliverance in Acts chapter 12 and verse 3. All of these, point, these points to a great uh, or unique uh, relationship between Christ and Peter. As years pass, uh, Peter's work receives less and less notice in the scripture. We do know that he was in Jerusalem when Paul came there from Damascus in Acts chapter 9 and verse 26. And 14 years later, he was at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. And we know that Paul met him at Antioch in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. 
which is the first recording of his appearing outside of Judea where Paul had to publicly correct uh, Peter on some things. And after this, we know little for certain about Peter's travel or his life. Only his epistles give us hints of his further life and works. But it's evident that he did undertake uh, various journeys to spread the gospel. We have to rely on uh, secular history and tradition to, to lead us to believe that Peter was martyred sometime around the age of 75, su suffering a violent death by crucifixion. And tradition tells us that Peter's request that he, was he be executed in an upside down position, saying that he didn't feel like he was worthy to resemble his master in his death. And we do know that, that uh, Jesus had predicted a violent death for Peter in John chapter 21, verse 18 through 19. And these are all some things we can know about the man Peter. Now let's look at some of the evidence that Peter is a writer of this epistle. First, there is the testimony of the letter itself or the internal evidence. In addition to signing the letter, the, the author calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ and an elder and eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ in chapter 5, verse 1. And he speaks of a dear one, that being Mark, as being with him in chapter 5 and verse 13. And he writes with the help of Silvanus in chapter 5 and verse 12. First Peter has much in common with the gospel accounts and the book of Acts also, which makes it obvious that they would and could only come from the knowledge that Peter had of Christ and others. The similarity existing in the language and teaching of First Peter and the speeches of Peter can be seen in the book of Acts. Some of those examples would be the reference of the, to the Father as judging without respect of persons in chapter 1, verse 17. And similar to that in, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, Peter's earlier words to, to Cornelius and to the group of Gentiles in his house, where in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, says, Peter says, of a, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Also similar is the allusions to God as having raised Christ from the dead in 1 Peter 1, 21. This reminds us uh, the, of the apostles' witness to the resurrection in Acts, in, uh, Acts ch chapter 2 and verse 32 and chapter 3 and verse 15. And we could also compare some other verses, several others, in fact, uh, just to list one more, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 through 12 uh, is similar with Acts chapter 3 and verse 18. This harmony of the language is an indication that the same Peter whose sermons are recorded in Acts is the same one who is a writer of 1 Peter. Other examples that show Peter had much in common with the gospel accounts as well as the book of Acts or when Jesus said to uh, Simon in Matthew 16 and verse 18, he says, There are Peter upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Peter would write later in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 through 8 that he would later describe chief, uh, Christ as a chief cornerstone of a spiritual house wherein his followers are living stones. Uh, and so other scriptures that are similar, uh, remember Jesus taught the lesson of humility when he wrapped a towel around him and washed the feet of those who looked down upon him as master in John chapter 13. And the similarity to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, uh, verse five uh, Peter would say obviously with this lesson in mind, Peter writes, Yea, of all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. There's the uh, similarity in 
in the lesson on humility. Jesus would also use the word adversary a lot in his, in his words in Matthew 5, 25, for example. And this word would, would also be used by Peter a number of times, uh, specifically in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 that we'll talk about later. And in addition to this internal evidence, there's plenty of external evidence as well. Uh, many references are made to Clement of Rome, to Polycarp, and to others, which attest to the authorship of this letter. Now, what about the time and place of this writing? In reading 1 Peter uh, 5 and verse th 13, we learned that the writer was in Babylon at the time uh, this letter was written. Uh, Babylon being a city on the Euphrates River or in the territory adjacent to that. The date of the writing of 1 Peter cannot be fixed to an exact date, but we'll try to mention some points that will help us to narrow that time period down to when this letter must have been written. First, there are several similarities between Paul's letter to the Ephesians and the first letter of Peter. Uh, many scholars conclude that these similarities exist because a copy of Ephesian epistle had been come into Peter's possession before he wrote uh, this first letter. Brother Guy in Woods and lists seven instances in, from the first chapter of Peter alone as proof of this statement. And this would place the date of this writing as sometime after A.D. 33. A second point as to the date has to do, do with the fact that John Mark was with Peter in Babylon in chapter 5 and verse 13. When Paul wrote his letter to those in Colossae, Mark was with Paul in Rome. The plans had been made to travel east in Colossians 4 and verse 10. Four or five years later, uh, he was still in Asia Minor, but was on the verge of returning to Rome with Timothy, Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11. So it's reasonable to conclude that within this interval, A.D. 63 to 67, that Mark traveled to Babylon and was in that city when 1 Peter was written. A third point has to do with the reason the letter was written. Peter writes in chapter 4 and verse 17 that for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. When Nero was on the verge of his persecution of the saints, and this would further narrow the date that this book was written to A.D. 64 to 65. So that's our conclusion that when this that, uh, uh, book was written. The occasion for writing this epistle. Peter writes these words in the fifth chapter in verse 12. I have written briefly, exhorting, testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. Brother Guy in Wood says that the design of the epistle was this. A, to exhort. B, to testify with reference to the true grace of God. And C, to encourage the saints to greater steadfastness. With the persecution of Christians at the hand of Nero just over the horizon, Instruction is given to Christians to endure the sufferings with the strength which comes in knowing the hope of heaven is there and the knowledge that Christ died for their sins. The time was coming when judgment must begin at the house of God. They would be dragged before the heathen courts. They would be reproached for the name of Christ. And the very fact that they were Christians would be regarded as criminals. Christians in these countries would be exposed to severe persecution. 
At the time of Peter's writings, it's thought that no special persecution against the church had begun. The expressions that Peter used are general and would imply that tribulation threatened but had not yet taken place, but it was at hand. Yet these Christians had to be warned of the trials that awaited them and encouraged to endure. Peter writes again in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12 through 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. There's the warning. As though some strange things happen unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceedingly joy. There's the encouragement to endure. And this brings us to chapter 1 of First Peter. Verse 1 begins with the word Peter. Uh, this signature says Peter was a writer of this epistle, as we've already talked about. And Peter was a name which the Lord himself had given to him on the occasion of their first meeting in John chapter 1, verse 42. The first verse in, identifies uh, the writer as Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. By designating himself an apostle of Christ, Peter calls attention not to himself, but to the commission, to his commission, and to the commission of the one who uh, gave him that. And this opening phrase is, uh, by Peter is uh, uh, a simple description or simple maybe characteristic when compared to the salutations of many of Paul's epistles. Paul almost always felt compelled to state that he was an apostle through the will of God. We see this in First and Second Corinthians, Ephesians, and, and other books in the Bible that are written by Paul. And the reason for this uh, practice is that many qu question Paul whether or not he was really called by God to be an apostle, perhaps believing that he was self-appointed to that post. Probably many people were remembering Paul's past and could not believe that he was an apostle. But no one questioned that Peter was an apostle chosen by Christ. The fact that, that this was written by Peter is also important when you consider the contents. If someone's going to tell me it's better for me to suffer as a Christian and even to rejoice in my suffering then I want to know what qualifies that person to offer such advice for this, as this. Well, P Peter is uniquely qualified to write this letter. He knew what it was like to suffer and yet remain loyal to Jesus in Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 5, verse 12 through 42. He also knew, knew the bitterness of turning away from the Lord, uh, Luke 22 and verse 62, when he denied Christ and went out and wept bitterly. Peter says that he was an apostle, and this word an apostle literally means one sent forth. Uh, though Jesus had many di disciples during his earthly ministry, he only chose 12 whom he designated as apostles. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 16. However, however, this fact does not mean that the Greek term translated apostle was only used with reference to the twelve. The, this word is used in a special or restricted way in regard to the twelve apostles. But it was possible to use the word many, in any time someone spoke of, of a person who was sent by another. In fact, the, the word apostle is used with reference to Christ. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 reads, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. 
Right, correct. Now, Peter writes uh, to the stranger scattered. And the King James Version says, and the New King James says to the sojourners of the dispersion. Well, a sojourner is a, Christ, is a pilgrim, someone who is a stranger in the land in which he or she is living. Uh, this designation suits the purpose of Peter's uh, letter quite well because he's encouraging his readers to remain faithful by reminding them that they're not permanent residents on the earth. In Peter's use of the word dispersion in the New King James, it's reference to the readers, to his readers that had led some to believe that uh, the recipients, recipients of this letter were Jewish Christians. Uh, evidence used to, to support this, uh, that Peter was addressing uh, G, or Jewish readership, is the fact that uh, Peter refers to the Old Testament several times in this epistle. Uh, Peter speaks from Isaiah chapter 40 and Psalm 118, Isaiah chapter 8, and Psalm chapter 34 in this first epistle of Peter. And we'll see that as our study continues in the next few weeks. Uh, moreover, a likely uh, conclusion is that Peter was writing to both Jew and Gentile readers. And certainly the use of Old Testament scriptures doesn't exclude Gentile, Gentile readers. We're not to believe that Gentile Christians were never acquainted with the Old Testament in, at that time. In fact, we can read in the book of Romans that Paul taught his Gentile readers that they were indebted to the Jews for their salvation, that in, in that becoming Christians, they were becoming Israelites in spirit, Romans chapters 9 through 11. Also, the geographical locations to which Peter was writing were areas where Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, did some of his greatest work. Several statements in 1 Peter certainly indicate that Gentiles were among the readers. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14, the epistle refers to, to their pre-Christian lives as their former lusts in the time of their ignorance. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10, Peter writes to the, to, the strange, to, the, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatius, and these other cities that were providences lying south of the Black Sea and west of the Taurus Mountains in the area we today call, uh, refer to as the country of Turkey. And those receiving this, the, this letter were Christians the elect, this verse 2 says, of these cities. The word elect uh, simply means chosen or who are chosen. One of the amazing things about the language we see in First Peter is the words and concepts that once applied to the Jews are now applied to all, both Jew and Gentile who have become Christians. The doc Bible doctrine of election or chosen according to the foreknowledge of God is, is that God chooses to save those who willingly come to him in obedience to the gospel. But how does God make that choice? Uh, we can see that in 1 Peter ch chapter 1, these first two verses Peter notes that the fact that election and its origin in the purpose and plan of God, but the manner and means by which he, it is accomplished must be found elsewhere. And, P, and Paul supplies this information for us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in verse 13 and 14. Paul writes here, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. 
verse 14, whereunto he called you by the gospel to the obtaining of the, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we see four things in these two verses. Number one, that God chose. Number two, he chose from the beginning. Number three, the choice was made in sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. And number four, those chosen were called through the gospel. We know that the gospel is addressed to all men. Mark 16, verse 15 and 16 says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and baptized shall be saved, but he believeth not shall be damned. From these two verses, we see that, number one, all are called by the gospel. Number two, all who believe and obey the gospel are saved. Three, God chooses or elects those who are saved. And D, or four, therefore God chooses to save all who obey the gospel. And this is the true doctrine of election. Verse 2 continues through sanctification of the Spirit. In verse 2, all three persons of the Godhead are mentioned as having a part in our salvation. We've already talked about uh, the Father's role as the one who chose, chooses the saved through his foreknowledge. The role of the Holy Spirit in our salvation is to sanctify us. Sanct the word sanctify is sometimes translated as holy or holiness. To sanctify means to, to separate. So Christians are people who have been separated from the world unto God. And the Bible all, often uh, attributes sanctification to the Spirit. We see this in Romans chapter 15 and verse 16. And also in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Three, we'll turn there and read that. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Chapter 2 and verse 13, which reads, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of of the spirit and belief of the truth. Now, how does the spirit separate Christians? In order to, uh, for us to answer this question, it's important to know, examine the process. To examine the process of sanctif sanctification as revealed in the Bible, it's, it's not a one-time event. As we go closer to God, our separation for, from the world is increased. Thus the Bible often uses the word sanctification to refer to the conduct of an individual. The Spirit doesn't miraculously separate a person, but rather the individual is instructor, instructed to follow after or pursue peace with all men and holiness. And the American Standard Version uses the word sanctification there. They're to pursue uh, peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see, God, see the Lord. The Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. One of the most definitive explanations of the process of sanctification is seen in 1 Thessalonians verse 4. Paul writes here, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3. And then he further states in verse 7, For God hath not called us unto cleanliness, uncleanliness, but unto holiness. Again, the American Standard 
version uses the word sanctification there instead of holiness. So sanctification involves the conduct of an individual. It's also important to notice the, that sanctification involves knowledge. First Thessalonians verse, chapter 4 and verse 4 reads that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That san sanctification demands knowledge gives us an indication of how the Holy Spirit works to sanctify an individual. All knowledge necessary to be pleasing to God is revealed through the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. Thus Jesus prayed to God, Sanctify them through thy spirit, thy word is truth. John 17 and verse 17. So we've seen the role of the Father, the role of the Holy Spirit, and finally we see the role of Jesus mentioned here in verse 2. That is, Christians are sanctified of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Here we learn the, that our salvation has a divine side and a human side. The human side of salvation involves our obedience, while the divine side concerns the death of Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for our sins with his blood. And then Peter closes his greeting and salutation in verse 2 with the words, Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Instead of a simple, casual greeting such as many first century letters contain, these words are offered by Peter that the readers of this epistle may experience the Christian blessings of grace and peace. The word be multiplied can mean may it abound also. So Peter is saying may it be given abundantly to you. The readers of this epistle were already recipients of God's grace and peace. But Peter's prayer is that they have more. A multiplication of God's favor, his grace, and peace, that spiritual tranquility, is needed to match the hostility with which these Christians he's addressing are about to be confronted with. This next section of, of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses one, uh, 3 through 5, is the title, The Future Circumstances of Their Salvation. And these verses uh, is part of the effort to encourage his readers to endure sufferings without turning their backs on Christian faith, on their, on their faith. Uh, Peter reminds them of the future of their salvation. He specifically addresses, or stresses rather, the following three things. Number one, that their hope, their future hope is based on a historical reality, that being the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And number two, their future hope is enduring. And number three, their hope is in the future beyond their present suffering. He begins uh, uh, verse three with the two words, blessed be. Uh, the Greek word here means to speak well of, to speak well of another, to, to praise, to give thanks to. When you're in the midst of persecution, may God be spoken well of is the idea here. Here, When God blesses men, he, he grants blessings on us, making us blessed. When we bless God, we declare that he is in his unlimited excellence, that he is absolutely praiseworthy. <clears throat> 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3 says, Peter is speaking of the one who is both the Father, both the God and the Father of Jesus. Is there a reminder here that, that God did not exempt Jesus from suffering, someone he loved dearly, then that we as Christians should not expect exemption either? That their God and Father so orders the lives of men on earth should, should be a, a matter of praise. It's not, the, it's not some remote uncaring, uninteresting God that Christians are dealing with. It's the same being who watched over the life of his only begotten son, a God who is powerful enough to be in control, and a God who loves and cares his children like a father. That Jesus Christ is Lord is a confession of joy. It tells us that the promised Messiah, Christ, became flesh, Jesus, took on human form, and also acknowledges that him as a master, the Lord, the one to whom we must gladly give our obedience. Our time is up, so we'll stop right there and pick back up with in the middle of verse 3 next week. I appreciate your attendance this morning and your attention.